welcome to the Medical Menemis Podcast, your source for memory techniques and accelerated learning in higher education. Now, here's your host, Chase DeMarco. You've looked into some of these materials for years and years and years, and with your background, it would just be really interesting to get your take even to a deeper level on some of them we're just kind of brushing over in this interview. Yeah, and I'm certainly, again, like related to the foundation that I'm putting together. I'm very interested in, you know, serious medical professionals who can actually plug in where I can't. Cause I've thought of going back to school and getting another PhD in neuroscience or whatever, but that's very unlikely to happen at my age and probably not even necessary. But if people are interested in this and they're, they're already accomplished and want to do research and figure out things, like it's really just a matter of creating the budget and going, going nuts with, I think, asking better questions or questions that aren't being asked because people who do research in this area, they often say in their memory research, well, we don't actually use memory techniques. And I'm just like, come on, why don't you? <laughs> if it, you would have such better questions and better, better research if you did. So I'm actively seeking ways to get some of those questions on the table and researched effectively so that it's not just my instinctual conclusions. Uh, uh, you know, it's, I'd love to verify it. Yeah, we definitely need some interdisciplinary approaches to some of these problems. And hopefully some of the audience that's listening to this will maybe reach out to you and, and show some interest in helping you build that and gain some more attraction and publicity for it. That would be great. So we did take a few more tangents there than I was initially planning, but the material is just so good. I got to let it go. Sort of going back to the original outline a little bit more, one of the topics that I still have a lot of trouble with too, and going back to the actual memory palace creations, I know that there are a lot of common pitfalls and mistakes and would really like to get your outtakes on maybe the most common ones and how to avoid them. Right. So one of the common mistakes is not creating memory palaces effectively. And so much of the teaching out there says, start at your door and then move inside of the building. And there's no doubt that that can work. But I found again and again and again in my own practice and in the practice of many, many thousands of people that if you would just actually draw your memory palace and think about it logically, the worst place to start is the door and moving inside because you're going to lead yourself into a dead end. So if you just take a look at your little drawing there of your apartment, it's just a floor plan sort of sketch. It takes two minutes. Don't you know turn it into the Mona Lisa or anything, just a sketch. Uh, of the floor plan squares on a piece of paper and you think where's the dead end here you find it and then you move towards the entrance and you move toward the entrance in the most linear and least forgettable way that that you can imagine and you will make it so much easier for yourself and then you'll be able to add more to the memory palace because you've led yourself towards an exit so i'm giving away some of what's in the free course but that's exactly the most common pitfall of all is that people can't figure out how to use memory palaces. I started to like make these little terms of the problems that people have is because they, they tell me, I, I, what, what, what do I do when I run out of space? And I call that memory palace scarcity and memory palace claustrophobia because they're leading themselves into the dead end and they're freaking out. So just reverse the process. Start at the dead end, which I now call the terminal station, and move your way outwards. So that's a huge thing. Another pitfall is that people just simply don't use their existing memory enough. They're trying to invent things. So back to radius, right? I'm not inventing a radio. I'm thinking of the radio that I used to have. And then when I wanted to add a US sticker, well, I used to have a US sticker or better said, my dad had one on his toolbox. And so I'm thinking of that. It already exists in my mind. And then the song I mentioned by Rancid, radio, you know, radio, 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 radio. Like I'm hearing that in my mind and it makes it so much easier to remember radius later. Uh, that was the word, right? Correct. Yes. Okay, I just <laughs> want to be sure. <laughs> Ulna radius humorous. Um, it's so much easier to remember because I have so many different multi-sensory, real lived memories that I'm drawing upon, right? I'm not inventing anything. It's not hard work at all because it's already there. And so when a lot of people come to memory, they go to some source of mnemonics, they have to learn the mnemonics, 
And then they're just creating a job. Whereas, you know, if you take a, it doesn't matter how difficult the term is, if you just split it up, and I'm sure you could give me some bizarre long term with multiple syllables, if you just break it up, you will find that there are things that are already in your mind that you can associate it at a syllabus by syllabus level so that you get the sound matched with your personal biography, your autobiographical memory, your episodic memory, your figural memory, your procedural memory, even even if you don't move your body, you know, you have the memory of what it's like to move your body. So you can tap into the actual movement part of your memory and you just weave it all together and you don't invent a, th a thing. The more you have to invent, the less you're using the magnetic memory method. There's a couple of exceptions to that, like if you use the major method, but even then I've reduced it down to the least amount of invention so that you can just focus on you, who you are as the ultimate resource. And then every movie you watch, every time you sit in, you think you're procrastinating and wasting time, you're not because you're just filling your mind with beautiful, wonderful, rich resources. And you can use your favorite movie characters and TV characters in your memory palaces. And so, you know, have at it, the more the merrier. So those are the two biggest mistakes is people don't make memory palaces well, and they don't rely on what's already in their mind. And the more that you get that right, the faster, easier, and more like that Disneyland effect of just like, oh man, I'm having the, the time of my life will happen for you when you're using these techniques. Great. I noticed that two of the things, I, I think these are from your course, so we don't need to go into two in depth about them and obviously want the audience to check out your course because it's going to go into so much more detail and give visuals for some of the topics we're discussing here, which might be a lot easier to learn. But I remember, I think, two different abbreviations or initializations that were used to kind of have a process. Uh, one, I believe, was cure, create, use, review, and explain. Mm, yeah. And then the other, I think, was create, uh, I have to check my notes, construct strategy, rotate solutions, examine, associate, test, and expand. So this is sort of a, I know you don't like to have too much of a systematic way to a lot of it. You want it to be more natural and creative, but are these two potential strategies that students can use until they become a little more fluent in the process? Right. Well, the first one is cure. Like the cure for memory uh, is, or the cure for forgetting is to create memory palaces, to use them, and then you know, rack and stack these images appropriately based on the fact that they're already there. You're just rearranging them in space and then explain to your brain what it is that you're doing. And that's just a teaching tool, really, but it's not a systematic process other than, the, and here's another mistake that a lot of people make is they try to do this with one memory palace, which is not my teaching. My teaching is to have multiple memory palaces. So create memory palaces in our cure, the C means create memory palaces with an S. If you're just creating one memory palace, you're not even really going to understand what a memory palace is in the same way that someone who bakes one loaf of bread is not going to understand what baking bread is. You know, you've got to make multiple memory palaces and making multiple memory palaces will unlock deeper levels of your spatial memory as it explores your autobiographical memory. So I really mean create multiple memory palaces. Nelson Dellis, who you mentioned, he's on my podcast. He's mentioned how many that he has. I don't even know how many I have. I create them all the time. Like every week I go into some building that I wasn't in before, boom, new memory palace. All the time I think of another friend from school where we had lunch one time randomly and I have enough of their kitchen, boom, another memory palace. Even if it's just as small as a kitchen, right? It's useful as an exercise just to create it as a memory palace in order to explore more of spatial memory. And, you know, you'd just be absolutely astonished by how much space you have in your head. But sometimes you've just got to get started and continue to do it. So that's the C. The U is to use them because a lot of people will create the memory palace and they'll never use it, right? <laughs> and so using this means that you take, I don't know, 10 parts of the body or 10 chemicals or 10 medicines, 10 side effects, whatever it is that you need to memorize. And you start at station one in your memory palace and you create some images. So if it was something like, ulna or radius or humerus, you would take that radio and you would put it right in that corner. And then to, to make it even more memorable, if you needed to, you could have, you know, someone like the band from 
that I mentioned rancid, they're jumping out of the speakers and breaking their own bones with their guitars or something like that, right? <laughs> to just give you a sense of where on the body it was. Or you could use Batman, like I said earlier, and maybe Batman is using the radio to break his own arm, you know, and specifically where those bones are located. But you got to use it and you'll learn this by doing. That's, that's a huge issue here. There's a lot, number of learning types. Some people need to know what something is. Some people need to know why something works the way that it does. Some people need to know how exactly everything works. And they need to know, you know, uh, all kinds of things. Some people are serial learners and so forth. All that's great to know about yourself. But at the end of the day, you're not really going to learn this unless you do it. So use is very, very important. Then rack them and stack them, you know, is just, again, this sort of be very, very deliberate and precise in your placement of these images. You really want to think about where they are in the memory palace because you're going to go back and trigger them off. And our, sometimes I teach this differently. So, you know, you might think my memory is suspect if you hear me saying it a different way somewhere else, but it also means review, but that's more in the explain part. But review is important as well because another mistake that people make is they think this is like a set it and forget it technique. Well, it isn't. It's a set it and then revisit it as many times as is necessary in order to get it into long-term memory. How many times is it necessary? That's entirely up to you and your practice because you can reduce the number of repetitions that are needed the stronger that your imagery gets and the better you get with the skill. But then I would say, don't be too sure, don't be too sure, don't be too sure, which is uh, very important. And do as many repetitions as needed and a little bit more just to be sure. And so how you place, how you rack them, really matters. You want to have integrity in it. You want to think that one is triggering off the other. Do you have enough space between the stations? Are you over cramming it and so forth? Racking them and how you rack them really matters. And then the E is to explain to yourself what was happening in that memory palace, which is what I formerly was meant as review for R. But explaining is a lot better because you want to think of yourself kind of as a theater director. And when you've got the band rancid with the radio or you've got Batman or whatever it is, it's not a movie. You're not replaying a movie. It's never going to be the same way twice. It's more like you're the theater director. You've, your memory palace is a stage and all these images that you create are actors and you just say action and they do things as they do. And as they are engaged in their action, you think, okay, radio, US sticker, ah, radius, right? And oh, that's that bone that they were breaking. That's where the radius is. And so that's got to be done as many times as necessary in order to get it into long-term memory. And for students who are really, really serious, I also throw on something called the big five, which is to read, write, speak, and listen from memory and for memory. So you would have a memory journal or your notebook and without cheating, without looking at anything, you just test yourself, self-testing, write out what it is from memory, and then you know listen to an additional lecture about that particular thing. Speak about it to a friend. Speak about it to yourself in the shower. Why? Because getting it through your mouth, the muscle memory of your mouth, will help make it a stronger memory. And you might be thinking, well, I don't have all the time in the world to do this. And I will say to you, oh, yes, you do. And not only that, by doing it, you will save time. You will save so much time. And uh, that's the cure. Right. Yeah, that'll definitely save you a lot of time in the long run, for sure. Even though it seems to take more time up front, but it'll save you in review time later on. It'll save you in having to carry around study notes, for instance. Everything can be uh, up in your head. Or if you have a memory journal, that's a, a good way to do it. Um, okay. How about the create mnemonic? Okay. Yeah. By the way, I'll say that as much as I dislike cell phones and so forth, they've reduced the incidences of people thinking I have schizophrenia because now it's normal to just go around talking to yourself. <laughs> but <laughs> in any case... <laughs> In terms of uh, creating mnemonics, I refer to it as magnetic imagery, because if you make sure that you go through multiple modes of perception and make it truly multisensory, that's what's going to make it magnetic. So whenever you can, whatever you create, or I mean, we're not even really talking about creating, we're talking about identifying, like this is the true Sherlock Holmes of like investigating what's already in your memory that you could use. So if it's a rock band or it's an actor or it's Homer Simpson or whatever it is, to really make it plump and robust and really you can, it sounds maybe difficult at first, but within a couple of seconds, you can hear Homer's voice, 
you can get an image of what he looks like. I, I actually don't really see images in my mind and I've n not really seen why it's necessary, but I do get this little ghostly sort of thing that you could call an image, but that's the least of my concerns. And if you're visual, then that's not a problem. Don't make it a problem, but you know, get a picture in your mind somehow. Um, you could feel the weight of Homer Simpson or feel whatever implement he might have in his hand to help you remember. And if a taste and smell can be involved, great. If it's a concept, like concept of justice and so forth, you can use it, but I would try to make it a bit more concrete. So it might be and Justice for All from Metallica, or it might be the Scales of Justice, or it might be the Blind Lady of Justice or whatever. If you can get a concept in there somehow, go with it. And uh, yeah, it's really, really something to be made multi-sensory and to really have a lived experience of it in the Memory Palace. Great. All right. I don't want to keep you here all day, but I did just have one more quick thing, especially because there's a medical student study skills book that I'm coming out with in the next couple of months. And I really wanted to add in your concepts of the memory journal. I think it's a very useful process. So if you wouldn't mind just giving a quick little rundown about that, how to use it, what things to add to it, that'd be great. Well, I'm one of those obnoxious teachers who can't really tell you how exactly to use it. And I talk about this in my book, The Memory Connection, which is the fullest teaching of memory journaling. But I say like how exactly you do it isn't nearly as important as that you do it and you figure it out for yourself. I have thought long and hard about making the magnetic memory method journal, but it just would be deeply inauthentic because the truth is, is that everybody's going to have their own preferences and that's a good thing. So it just starts with 99 cents at the dollar store or whatever dollar stores sell things at these days, which is probably more than 99 cents. It's probably like 225. <laughs> Most of the time, yes. <laughs> but in any case, Go and buy whatever journal works for you. Get a nice pen, get a pencil or whatever, and start to draw your memory palaces in your memory journal. And should it be on page one? I don't know. Like some people like to make a little contract with themselves. I'm going to complete 30 memory palaces in the next two weeks or whatever. If that works for you, do it. And again, I talk all about this in the memory connection, the ins and outs, the things that you can do. What's more important is that you just start to journal your memory. Memory journals are a great place for drawing your memory palaces. Memory journals are a great place for self-testing. So I love to have the memory palaces like in the first half of the book and flip to the back to do self-testing. And so that's a, a procedure. You can, like in the beginning, I would recommend that people write out what it is that they created in their memory journals. And I still do this from time to time when it's like really heavy Sanskrit, you know, actual Sanskrit words with English meanings. I'll, I'll really write out what was happening there because it helps make it more real to the mind. And then sometimes when you make a mistake and you don't get something correct, you can go back and, and like look at it objectively, not berate your mind and try to juggle it all in your mind, but it's actually relieved from your mind because it's sketched out in a book. So I think of it in terms of being an artist. Artists keep sketchbooks, and there's a reason why they keep sketchbooks. It's because they need a place to keep all those drawings organized but also it gives them the history of their progress. So when you're training your memory, it's very useful to have a history of your progress and to not only see just how far you've come with the skills, but actually be able to refer back to some of the mistakes that you made and objectively, without punishing yourself, observe how to improve your practice because it's there and it's reachable, it's scannable. It's, it's, it, you can interact with this history of your skill. Many people who go to the gym do the same thing. They have a notebook and they write out how many sets and what weight they did so that they can add just a little bit more next time. And you don't, you can use memory techniques to do it, but I often teach people, if you don't have to memorize it, save the memory skills for the things that you do have to memorize. And uh, that's another thing that memory journals do is help you organize and sift, sort, and screen the kinds of things that are the high order, 20% in the 80-20 rule of information that you actually will benefit from having in memory. So you can plan what it is that actually really matters. And you'll see that if you just focus on the 20% that really, really matters, then a lot of the other things will just fill in almost naturally, which is another sort of reason I use the word magnetic. Good. That actually, I find it a, a very useful tool currently in just sometimes drawing out little mnemonics and helpers next to my actual study notes. And that way, if I fail to rehearse it enough within a, a certain time period and I forget it, well, it's right there. It's correlated to my written notes from, you know, from class or from something like that. So you can review it 
really quickly and don't have to worry about potentially forgetting it, even using these mnemonic devices. Yeah, exactly. And you know, you got the best of both worlds too, because you can just take a photograph of those pages, pop them into Evernote or whatever, and you can review it again on the screen if you want to. There's reasons that you might not want to, like digital amnesia, but nonetheless, you can get over the thing about, well, I don't want messy notebooks and papers flying all over the place because you do have the option of photographing everything and uh, putting it into the into the machine for safekeeping. Good point. All right. I usually end these with uh, three quick questions called a walk down memory lane. Uh, You ready to take a walk with me? Absolutely. Let's get our boots on. (laughs) All right. First question is, is there anything that you wish you could remember better? Oh, well, no, because I can remember it if I want to. (laughs) (laughs) I always find that's an interesting question to ask memory experts, because even then, sometimes there's there's little things here or there that might stick out or that they don't put the... uh, the memory training efforts into as much as they might want to. Yeah. The only thing that maybe would come to mind is is music, but I don't really struggle to remember music because I've been a musician pretty much my entire life. And I guess it would be kind of cool to just be able to download music into your head without having to, you know, put in dedicated practice. But then you would lose a certain je ne sais quoi uh, of what music is because part of the beauty of being able to play a piece is the dedicated practice of learning how to play it. So I wouldn't want it. I wouldn't want that. I'm just happy with memory as it is. Okay. All right. Looking back now, is there anything you would have changed about your approach to your memory training? Yeah, I think that I would have, well, I mean, I didn't have the option because I hadn't gone through all of the rigmarole. But when I was doing biblical Hebrew, for example, I would have taken all of my learned and lived experience with German and just put it in the time machine and given it to biblical Hebrew because I struggled way more than necessary with that when I was in university. <laughs> and uh, and if, if someone had written books like I've written about it, I would have read it and just followed the instructions because it would have made it a lot easier. <laughs> All right. Yeah, I guess once you learn more about one topic, it can also bleed into other topics and just makes it easier to, to grow onto that already stored memory and knowledge. Mm, indeed. Third question, is there anything you wish you did differently in your side gig or career so far? Uh, you know, I, there, there are ways where I could certainly be a better entrepreneur and not so control freakish over certain technological things where I don't have trust over certain people. But I follow my gut and sometimes it just takes time to find the right people and it's well worth not making bad hiring decisions, even if it's a weakness of mine. And I I acknowledge it as a weakness in my entrepreneurial journey, but by the same token, I'm doing just fine. And uh, I think that there's just other directions that I want to go that will help fill in those gaps, especially through the foundation project, where perhaps there will be the ability to just get a manager to, to do a lot of things and, you know, just keep me out of the kitchen and I can just work with the medical professionals, so to speak. But even then, like I, I'm a person who meditates so much that I no longer recognize the role of free will. And I understand why that it's hard for others to get over the free will discussion because I used to be a very, very willed person and would have fought tooth and nail to fight for the existence of free will. But now I just sort of accept the world the way that it is. And it's odd to me to think about, well, would you change this or would you change that? Because it's like, yes, but no, because I couldn't have anyway. There's no evidence of, of free will and certainly none coming. And so I can think all that I want about what I would have done this, that, or the other way. And I could say, yeah, well, my weaknesses as an entrepreneur and so forth, blah, blah, blah. Like it doesn't mean anything. It just it is the way that it is. And basically all that we can do is set goals based on our existing competence because if you set goals outside of your existing competence, you're, you're really making it a bit more difficult journey than you have to. And maybe we should have talked about that before. But in any case, yeah, just set goals based on your existing competence. Lay the map out in front of you, knowing that the map is not the territory. The map will change as you cast light into the darkness of the unknown. And you'll have a much better time of things. And so, yeah, and you don't need free will. Actually, as, a, as Gary Weber, from whom I've learned so much about meditation in books like Happiness Beyond Thought, which I highly recommend, and Evolving Beyond Thought, he often says that his life runs a lot better without him in it. And I found that to be true of mine as well. 
Huh. And more resources to add to the list. And speaking of, um, I know we've talked about your free course. I know you have a master class as well for those that want a deeper dive. Mentioned some of the books um, that you've published. And obviously, anyone can go to Amazon and type in your name and just see all of the work you've done in there. Are there any other resources or courses that you would like to mention before we end? Well, there are a zillion of them. I mention many on the podcast. I mean, as you know, I interviewed a lot of other people. I would recommend if they, if mm-hmm. they've been on my podcast, just assume that I recommend them. But I have many videos on YouTube where I talk about different books and so forth. But here's the thing. It doesn't really matter uh, at the end of the day. As long as the person that you're learning about memory techniques from can do what they say they can do, like just buyer beware cuz there are tons of books out there by people who obviously don't know what the heck they're talking about, right? Or they really haven't applied these techniques to large learning projects. So be careful around that. But no matter what you pick, even just the most general memory training book can help you so long as you read it from cover to cover, you do what it's asking you to do. And you give it the good old serious college try, as was once said once upon a time, and don't create a sob story if it doesn't work, because it's not the book that's the problem. It's always the individual. And that might be some tough love. But if things aren't working, don't point your, your finger at the world until you've pointed it at yourself. And ju- then just read another one, because everybody's memory is based on the same brain structural and brain chemical rules as everyone else's. So the people who can learn the London traffic system and get the knowledge, as they call it, in the London cab driving world, and the people who can break memory competitions, et cetera, records in the competitions, it has nothing to do with IQ. It has nothing to do with a special brain structure. It has nothing to do with anything other than that they have learned the rules that govern memory and they've put in the practice. And typically that has to do with a deep understanding of what these techniques are that guides their practice. And consistency in the practice. So there's just an absolute wealth and abundance of information on how to train your memory. All of it utterly useless if you don't take one course from beginning to end and apply the things that are said in that course to your practice. And then I would say, take another one. And I call this taking it one sip at a time, SIP. Study these techniques implement the techniques and practice them with the information that improves your life and ideally the lives of others, which is what your audience does. And so I commend you for bringing memory techniques to med- existing medical and, and future medical professionals, because this is something that you practice for life. It is a martial art of the mind and you don't get to the black belt and then stop. You get to the black belt and then you create a dojo. And so that's what you're doing, which is a wonderful thing. And I thank you for doing it. No, I thank you so much. This has been such an informative interview and so many great resources to point future physicians and others in higher education to. I'm really excited that we finally got to sit down and do this. And I know it's going to help out a lot of people. So on that end, thank you so much, Dr. Anthony Mativier, The Magnetic Memory Method. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you, Chase. It was a great time. I appreciate it. Thank you.